Welcome back. In this 10 minute session, we're going to be starting to think about how we can apply some of these theories and philosophies to online social networks. Now, I want to remind you, these are just tools, okay? So they're like lenses through which you might decide to analyze something. They're not truths, they're theories, okay? But this is probably the hardest part of what we do as social scientists and humanities scholars and um, thinkers in general. It's easy enough for us to go back in time and critique the ideas of Marx or Freud or Foucault or French and Raven or Weber. But we need to remember they were starting from blank slates. They were, they were theorizing the complexity of society that was present to them in their social life. For Marx, that was the Industrial Revolution and people working in factories in a period where they were all told they were suddenly empowered and free, but didn't feel so. In you know, French and Raven, it was the rise of the big you know, American corporation. For us, in the last 20 to 30 years, we've seen the rise of the internet. And we're only just beginning to theorize it, theorize our experience of it as well. So there's no wrong or right answers here. There's an emerging body of scholarship of people who are also applying these theories. But we're not asking you to look at that body of scholarship. You might do that in an upper level subject. But what we are asking you to do is build on the shoulders of a giant or two and try to apply a basic theory to what you want to talk about in terms of your everyday life. Now, that can be that you disagree with the theorists or you want to augment what they said, for example. Or it might be that, yeah, totally see the post panopticon at work and this is how I see it happening. Now, also, you can be online. You can decide to analyze Facebook. I've been on Facebook since the beginning for almost 20 years. I cannot believe it. Um, and so I would probably choose that. But that said, it's so normalized to me now that it, in some ways it's even harder to theorize something that is so normal to us in life. But have a go at it if you want to. For younger students, they tend to not be on Facebook. It's associated with like grandma and parent and not cool anymore or something. I don't know what it is. Um, but there may be some other form of social media you're on. You might be on Discord. You might be a gamer. And you might be a Snapchatter. You might be whatever you want. And so choose one of those platforms of social media and have a look and, and think about that about it. And you don't need to use the big buzzwords of network theory like hubs and weak links and connectors. If you want to have a go, you can. Now, um, the other thing I want to say is there's all those people who are like, I hate the internet. I try to stay away from it. I have no internet footprint and I've never used it. And that's fine um, because that's a really interesting space to theorize to. Why? Why don't you want to? Uh, does it feel like alien and disconnecting to you? Are you really worried about your footprint? Have you been taught in school that you, know, you might put things on the internet and it'll never get back at you? Or you're just fine for your own mental health that you're not connecting with the internet. You can still theorize those things. You can still um, use the, the, the vocabulary we're learning here in an academic way around power to do that. Okay, I promised you this will only be 10 minutes, so I'm going to try to go quickly. So from um, the very advent of, of the internet, as we saw in the first online article, academic article, that we looked at last week, um, theorists have been theorizing this as a space and um, thinking about you know, how it feels to be on the internet, thinking about the sort of communities that are forming on the internet, for example. Um, one of the preeminent people who've been doing that, um, probably since about the 1990s, so very early days of the internet, is somebody called Sherry Turkle. She's built an entire career around this. And I encourage you to look up her body of work, whether, whether just by Googling her, her presence, um, you know, watching a couple of TED Talks by her or about her, or even using the OneSearch feature of your online library search page and looking at her published publications. Because she's a very interesting thinker and she's sort of like queen supreme of internet theorization. Now, um, what she was saying from the very earliest days is that uh, about it being a place of, you know, the new democratic society, people had lost um, uh, they, you know, hope in, in the way that our actual existing democratic process works. They've seen that it's become fueled with lobbyists and career politicians and just continues to disenfranchise the average person. Um, and so they were like, well, this is like the better version of democracy because anybody can do it. Like you don't have to go through a publication process to get published. You can just start your own blog. You can, you know, you can be part of a forum. This is how democracy is going to be um, really renovated. This is um, what democracy should be and um, a real direct participation, just like the Athenian forums. Now, um, other people were saying they're seeing new forms of social organizations starting to arise and, you know, theorizing the rise of the avatar and the idea of it as a playful space. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later on as well. Whereas from the very beginning, other people were talking about it in terms of a language of fear and caution. And we continue to see these two ways that people talk about the Internet today. So we can see that some theorists say social networks are websites that connect people virtually in this day and age. If you aren't active on social networks, you're in danger of being out of the loop. Social networks are wonderful tools that can reinforce your brand, try and sell something, and allow you to make valuable content, share information, network, extend your brands. So she's obviously talking about this in terms of a marketing way. This is from a book published in 2009 called Me 2.0. Um, and so he has that glass half full or fully full um, view um, that I was just talking about, right? Um, wonderful. Absolutely great. Um, but of course, other people have that more negative one and you probably began to see the rise of, of this becoming a more prevalent discourse from about the year 2010 when this piece was published in The Australian because other people were starting to say it at the same time. In many ways, Facebook is reminiscent, she said, of the Panopticon, a prison designed by English theorist Jeremy Bentham in 1785. It provides the illusion of freedom that requires people to engage in increasingly restrictive self-monitoring behavior in relation to themselves and others. So empowering, disempowering, right? So you can talk about it in you know, those very simple ways, but try to apply a theory to it.
Now, remember, though, that it's not just empowerment or disempowerment, or it's not just about giant internet, you know, Zuckerbergs of the world and corporations or the NSA surveillance, but it's everywhere, right? And it's never in equally distributed. So remember that Foucault said that. And he, he, um, he wants us to think really carefully about the stuff that's beyond the threshold of consciousness. And that's what we're asking you to do, too. The stuff that you'd never really thought about before. Not the obvious stuff. Not power as force or power as, um, you know, something really blunt. But power in a more complex way, if you can think about it that way. I like to use the analogy of The Incredibles for this here um, in various ways, probably because my youngest child is 12 and my oldest child is turning 22 next month. And so um, I've been watching kids' movies for a very long time, and I still think they're great. But um, if you remember The Incredibles or have ever seen it, you might follow along. Here we have the baddie. Um, and he says, when everyone's super, nobody will be. And that's sort of the famous lines from the movie. But that's basically what Foucault is saying. You know, power can never be equally distributed. So, you know, that can mean that we're seeing the rise of, um, you know, powerful influencers, for instance, on the internet, or we're seeing hubs, right? Or we're seeing um, corporate things happening. Like, even though this seems like this free, ever expansive cloud-like technology that isn't place-based and can go on forever, what we need to remember is that these contemporary social theorists have told us that power can never be equally distributed. And so you need to start thinking through, you know, okay, so who are the elites on the internet? You know, the elite in Dye's terms, Diane Harrison, one of your extra readings, um, the elite are the few who have power, the masses are the many who don't. The elite are the few who control what is valued in society and use that control to shape the lives of others. Who are the elite on the internet? Okay. Technology, as we'll think about even more throughout this wonderful journey that we're going to be on this semester, changes the nature of communication and power and also identity. Ask yourself perhaps the question, who are the new elites in these online virtual networks? What are the specific modalities and microphysics of power in relation to particular structures of the social media? You might just use that. You might use those as getting started questions, but I do want to direct you to the weekly guide where you have prompt questions. Choose one of those to answer, but these other questions can help inform your getting started thinking. Now, we've talked about hubs and clusters, right? And we've talked about how in the Facebook features, um, you can see, you know, people that you didn't know that you were connected to, perhaps by a weak link, or perhaps because you're clustered in an area, um, maybe geographical, like y'all went to school together, or you have a friendship group from, you know, girl guides that you were part of way back when, um, and that connects you to somebody else. But we can also think about um, hubs in, in other ways, in corporate ways, if you want to think about the terms that um, French and Raven introduced, or even, um, you know, Weber and, and Marx introduced when they start to think about economics. So in the early days of the internet, when people thought about it as an economic free zone, in particular because it hadn't really been um, financialized yet, I think there's a better word for that, but nobody had really, like, this was before we even had PayPal, guys. Like, there was no such thing as um, paying for things on the internet. And so the only way money in the early days of the internet was present in terms of, um, it was in terms of who had the power to begin to create the dominant hubs like Google or back then Yahoo or uh, Hotmail. And that's shifted over time, right? We've got different corporate ones now. Um, but you might want to think in economic terms here, in terms of, of, of these hubs. This is a snapshot of, um, of the most dominant ones in, in 2017. And, and the implications of those power, um, powers in terms of um, economics is, is just fascinating, uh, particularly for those of us who care about books. You know, looking at how Amazon is increasingly dominating um, the social space is, is, is concerning. Um, but there's, there's some other things that are worth looking at in this picture as well. And... Um, you can see, for instance, AOL. Who even knows that exists? How interesting that it's not there anymore. Uh, but if you start to drill down a little bit deeper into this image, and you can find it on the internet, you'll see that um, you know, porn sites, for example, also um, are becoming huge. Um, Reddit is interesting to see that it's on there as well. It's just a place where like anyone can ask questions about anything. So all very interesting. Now, going back to my analogy of the Incredibles, if you'll bear with me, we can also think about um, structures of power in the digital age right now. Like Diane Harrison gave us, um, alongside Weber, some some fairly straightforward ways to think about power, you know, traditional power, bureaucratic power, charismatic power, that was favorite, right? And um, in some ways, you, you might be able to see the movie Incredible is as a kind of allegory of that. Like here we have Mr. Incredible, he's trapped in this servanthood life where he is is, is one of those basically equivalents of the factory workers that, that Marx was theorizing, no power at all, not getting anywhere, just, you know, hunched over. And his boss is this domineering despot. Um, but he has this alternative life um, where he's a superhero and he gets to do amazing superhero things. So um, is that what the internet has felt like to you? Maybe are you an amazing gamer, but you're like your everyday life or you just got to like turn out to uni to your degree and go to your dumb job is incredibly um, disempowering. You might want to think through that, right? And so, you know, go back to, to those slides um, where that, that part, portion of the lecture where you start to think about ways that you can deploy um, power here where, you know, maybe legal rational power in the university or in work is awful or in Central Link is awful, but maybe you've developed some like charismatic alter persona, for example. Um, so people are emplaced in structures of power and there are new structures of power, right? And, and you might want to think about that in terms of adapting French and Raven, for example. So when French and Raven, he, they talked about carrots and, and sticks. This is really, really, really quickly go back. If you'll bear with me here, I'm looking at the time. Boop, 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 boop. They talked about reward and coercion and legitimacy, expert power and referent power. Um, you know, you might think about 
what kinds of people have that kind of thing on the internet, right? Like, so how does social power work in, in this digital age where, um, you know, you might think about, okay, so referent power, that's, you know, like Dash, he's like the new hacker who can like, like even though he's a kid, he normally would not have any power at all, just seems to be able to solve like every situation because he's so much speedier at tech. Or like even, you know, Jack Jack is like, like you know, the next generation digital native who's just going to be like even more super powered than, uh, for example, uh, Dash. Or you, like you might want to think about like Frozone who's like, he's got this cool avatar going on. And um, with the racial elements of, of, of power on the internet, for example, you might think about poor Violet who's the shrinking um, one on the internet, does not feel at all um, like it's a place of emancipation, of charisma, um, just feels reduced to nothing. You know, she's, she's perhaps like there but the lurker who never posts because she doesn't have the confidence to or somebody who has been bullied in the past and, um, and so is, is conscious of the internet as a place of, of terror actually. You might think about like Mrs. Incredible and you know that, that type of persona that suddenly has to like do freaking everything all the time, never turns off. It's a place that was supposed to be emancipating, but like now you've got to like check every single website and every single app and do all of the things all of the time. And um, you know, what does that mean in terms of the feminization of labor on the internet, for example, in power versus empowerment? You might think about, you know, the the, the kind of the terrorists of the internet. Um, and, and then, you know, the the, the the hackers on the internet as well. Just, just start thinking about these sorts of things. Um, and then think about Foucault as well. Foucault is super, super important and, and he is really, really um, a key theorist, and he thinks about modalities of power, like manipulation, threats, and seduction, suggestion, and enticement, negotiation, persuasion. And just like you learned this week in your reading by Alan, he puts place in relation to structures. So, you know, that might be your home, or it might be your place of work, or it might be North Australia, or it might be the fact that you're a migrant, or um, it might be a place that is a like a website, um, or a particular app that you use. Um, and you might want to think about that in terms of structures and agents as well. So how